первая часть профессора Хейга будет посвящена теоретическим вопросам, да, патологии позвоночника, использования электромиографии, и в том числе и параспинальному мэппингу. Спасибо. Доктор Хейг. Thank you. Um, in the United States two years ago, I was teaching at a conference and I ran into a couple of brilliant Ukrainian neurophysiologists who convinced me that this is a place worthy of really working with some of you experts. Um, I was just delighted to find out that, uh, that I could come here and visit. Um, Ukraine is, of course, in our news every day now in the United States for reasons that I don't want to think about. Um, but it also is a country we've watched for quite some time, and it's pretty neat to be here with you. Uh, I had a wonderful trip uh, around the city of Kiev, and uh, I'm very glad to be here. Is this getting in the way of people? Should we move this yes. over a little yes. bit? Sure. Thank you. Sure. So, Oksana, thank you so much. It's great to be here. Um, in my country, when somebody's up here talking, your job is to stop me and interrupt me and ask questions. If you don't do that, you will fall asleep. Also, if I talk too fast, we're in trouble. Google Translate, not so good in Ukrainian, so I still have to use English, I'm sorry. So th this, is, this is who I am. I am a medical doctor. I am I'm not a physiotherapist. Um, I specialize in the field of physical medicine and rehabilitation. So after medical school, I did not become a neurologist, I did not become an orthopedic surgeon, I became a physiatrist, or a physical medicine and rehabilitation doctor, which is four years of training after medical school, learning about how to rehabilitate people with brain injuries and spinal cord injuries and strokes and amputations. And as part of that, in the United States, all rehab medicine doctors become neurophysiologists. We spend quite some time training in neurophysiology. Some of our neurologists, but not all, become neurophysiologists. So it's a little bit different in the United States. Um, physiatry is a specialty that's very odd. We, we don't own a particular organ system. You know, you, neurologists own nerves, orthopedists own bones, cardiologists own heart. We own function. We own how do people get back into their life. Um, and the other odd part of our specialty is our main tool is not a knife, our main tool is not a pill, our main tool is a team of physiotherapists and occupational therapists and speech therapists and nurses and psychologists. We pull this team together to do the rehabilitation. Um, yes, I'm, I'm an old man now because I'm an emeritus professor at Michigan. Um, and just one more push uh, to understand rehabilitation, and, and, I, and I think you're familiar with this. When we are looking at diagnosing a nerve problem, we have to do it in the context that health condition has to relate to what activities we want the person to do, how they participate in society, what they want to be, what their personal traits are, how their body functions normally, and of course the world around them in Ukraine is different from the world in Brunei or in Japan, right? And so this is what our nerve diagnostics have to aim towards, is to improve somebody's ability to be part of their society. So I grew up in a town of Milwaukee in Wisconsin, which has a lot of Ukrainians, and then I trained in uh, the world's tallest rehab hospital. Maybe not the best, but the tallest in Chicago. Uh, after which, uh, eventually, I went to the University of Michigan, where I spent 20 years as a professor. And then, as my children moved east, um, I moved to this little state of Vermont, which we'll show a few pictures of, which is between Montreal and Boston in the far north. So Oksana keeps asking, don't you need a coat? Isn't it cold? And I said, no, it's not cold here. This is like summer. <laughs> Uh, so this is my wife Bridget and I, and in Vermont every day we go out and uh, cross-country ski in the winter. This is what we love to do. Um, so uh, yes, so Vermont is famous for skiing, uh, for maple syrup, the sugar, and for beautiful fall colors. In the autumn it's very beautiful there. In Vermont, I continue my academic work, but I do a lot of work helping build programs around the world. So in the United States, I'm helping insurance companies come up with plans to manage pain problems. 
and in other countries I help them build programs. Uh, uh, when you look at earthquakes and hurricanes and other disasters, the rehabilitation response to these was not well organized and so I put together teams of people to help uh, governments and the World Health Organization understand how to respond to natural disasters. And I have a little doctor's office. I'm, I'm actually a real doctor in a little office in Vermont, which is wonderful. But mostly, I like to do these swimming, biking, kayaking. Let's talk about pain and nerves. This is my son. This is my brother. William in, is in a lot of pain, but he has no nerve damage. And by the way, he's functioning well. Tom has a lot of nerve damage. He has a spinal cord injury. Uh, it happened on a bicycle accident. But he's not in any pain, and he also has a good quality of life, right? So the idea of nerve damage and pain and function and quality of life, it's not a linear process, right? When we find nerve damage, it's only part of the story. So electrodiagnosis. You know, you are all experts at this, but I start at the very basic level which is this picture, you know? When somebody comes to your laboratory, you look at them and you say, could it be the brain or the brain stem or the spinal cord? Are they spastic, right? Could it be anterior horn cell, the nerve root, the plexus? Could it be a focal neuropathy? Could it be a polyneuropathy? Is there a neuromuscular junction problem? Is there a muscle disease? Or is it really a musculoskeletal or bony problem that somebody thought was from a nerve, right? So when we look at a patient, we take this line down the body to the place that they're complaining of and try to make a differential diagnosis. So why do an EMG? Well, of course, to find a radiculopathy, right? But also to rule out other causes. Mm -hmm to find out where that lesion is exactly, to find out how severe it is, and to find out how old it is. This is all information you can provide to your referral sources, and this can affect how they treat the patient. So when you think about your electromyography report, you might think, did I address each of these questions? With our needles and our electrodes, uh, we can make many different diagnoses. You know, we're talking today quite a bit about radiculopathy. But is the radiculopathy from disc herniation, spondylolisthesis, spinal stenosis, or something like a tumor or an infection, right? And although our EMG may not differentiate this in some cases, it often provides hints and as clinicians listening to the story of the patient, we often have an impression of this that's maybe better than the people referring patients to us because we have the time while we're testing to, to hear their story. Oh, and I'm sorry, and bony instability can also cause radiculopathy. But when we do our testing, our job is also to be sure we're not missing something else. The pseudo-radiculous syndrome is a word that Jeffrey Saul put together when he wanted to describe things that look like radiculopathy, uh, but are not. And I included here inflammatory radiculitis, but also lesions in the plexus. You know, back pain is ubiquitous. One half or one third of you has a backache today. And if you happen to have a tumor in your plexus, you will also complain of your backache, and we will think it's a radiculopathy, but it's actually the plexus, right? Mononeuropathies uh, at the fibular head, the peroneal, neuro, per, peroneal or fibular nerve. And polyneuropathies like the diabetic. Diabetics also get backaches, right? You can have a backache and leg pain and it's not together. Myopathy would be odd, but you've seen it. And then there's something called sclerotomal radiation, which means uh, that the pain that is shooting down the leg comes from a bone or a ligament or a tendon. Mm -hmm. And there are a number of studies, and there's clinical experience, but a number of studies that say that if you inject a painful chemical into the sacroiliac joint, you can get pain below the knee. If you inject it into other places, you can get pain below the knee that sounds like nerve. When someone has had a herniated disc and they walk funny for a while, of course the disc herniations just get better, 
but they're walking funny, they begin to get trochanter bursitis and they have pain down their leg from a different cause. Operating on the back will not fix their trochanter bursitis, right? So when I examine the patients, now this is in English, it's a poem, so the rhyming is only in English, not Ukrainian. But I say you have to poke the troke, smack the sacroiliac, whip the hip, and upset the fusset, right? And so when somebody comes into my office, part of my routine is to push on the sides here for the trochanter, right? Push her on the sacroiliac joint. Or have, if they say it hurts right here, that's uh, actually a validated test called the Fortin finger test for the sacroiliac joint. If they're sitting, I ex internally rotate their hip and they say, ouch, here. And upsetting the facets is to have the person rotate, arch their back, and that causes pain, right? And so I'll always do this on a radiculopathy case because even if they had a clear history of radiculopathy in the past, these are mechanical consequences of radiculopathy. And then there are things that I don't know if you've heard of before. Has anybody heard of the posterior primary ramus syndrome? Or the bent spine syndrome? Maybe some of you in neurology have heard of bent spine. I see a couple of heads nodding, right? And these are things we may pick up on our EMG and have to understand. Uh, or, or failed surgery syndrome, of course, too, right? If people operate on the back muscles. And then finally, of course, whether it's an upper limb or lower limb, you know, if people have pain from the neck down to the arm, you know, it's carpal tunnel syndrome, ulnar neuropathy, in the leg, fibular head, or tarsal tunnel. These are all things that can happen. And the resounding theme here is the presence of low back pain does not mean the person can't have another cause of leg pain or arm pain, right? You can't assume that back and leg pain or neck and arm pain are related to the same problem. <sighs> Protocol. Each of you learned from experts, from the boss lady <laughs> and others, how you should work up a radiculopathy. And most of the people that I talk to, the protocol they use, it comes from uh, the culture of their professors, not from science. There is science, and I want to introduce some science here so that you can have something that's much more valid. Uh, electromyography is an art you're using your brain to make decisions. But the more artistic you are, the less we know what you did, the less people can understand the results, right? So the protocols are great because a student can learn them, uh, because we can actually measure the sensitivity and specificity of a particular protocol. And because somebody who reads that you did this pr protocol or that protocol can look and say, ah, oh, you didn't test any L3 muscles. I don't believe you tested what I was looking for, right? But the problem is that, you know, either you have an extensive protocol that tests way too many muscles and hurts, or else you miss unusual diagnoses, right? There are unusual diagnoses that come occasionally, and you'll miss them if you don't have an extensive protocol. Um, all of us know that we can finish a standard EMG and think, ah, oh, there's something else that I should test. This person fractured their ankle, so I should look at the uh, anterior tarsal tunnel syndrome. You know, you come up with odd things. And also, when you do the EMG, it's not so black and white. It's not so normal, abnormal. Maybe you see a train of fibrillation potentials, but you can't reproduce them. Maybe you see some motor units that look kind of funny, but you're not so sure. And it's you as a clinician who has a clinical suspicion who says, I think I need to do some more testing. I, I need to chase this down and be sure I know what's going on. So the goal for many of us is not to have a protocol that's perfect, but to have a protocol that's a very, very good screening protocol so that when you're done and it's normal, you know you don't have to look further, okay? When you're done and it's abnormal, you may have to do more testing, okay? So this is what we look for is a screening protocol. Uh, the early protocols, as I said, came from logic, from people's sense of the anatomy and what muscles they think ought to happen. And these were smart people. These were not, uh, these were Ernie Johnson and John Melvin and some of the great pioneers of electromyography were very smart people.
but it was their logic, it wasn't their data that drove them. Uh, a man named Knudsen in the 1960s actually got data, but nobody quoted his work. Um, they're driven by these thought leaders. You know, if you're trained in Germany, you have a different sense of it than if you're trained in Italy. Sometimes they were completely wrong based on what we know now. Okay, so the old books and the new books often. Examples are some of the techniques that they used to test the paraspinals. In some of the books, they would absolutely positively miss every radiculopathy. So if you think it's an L5 radiculopathy and you put the needle to bump into the L5 bone, if you palpated correctly, you will miss 100% of radiculopathies, but that's in the textbook. Uh, S1, the S1 nerve root has no presence in the paraspinal muscles. And yet many of these protocols look at the paraspinal muscles to prove it's a radiculopathy. But you will never find S1 in the paraspinals. Some of you are shocked. We have to come back to why you think I'm wrong. I'm right. The dogma, the, the, the rule is a radiculopathy has to have two muscles from two nerves plus the paraspinals. Well, who said so? That's somebody's logic. That's not data. When somebody has a clinical radiculopathy, what do we find on an EMG? What is sufficient? That's just what somebody said in a book and everybody else copied them. And you all use, I suppose, a zero to four plus for positive waves or fibrillations, two plus positive waves, three plus positive waves. Until four or five years ago, nobody had ever showed any inter-rater reliability of that. It's not that good, it's not horrible. But what you see and what I see will be quite different. And, and for 60 years, people just assume that, well, it's two plus, so it's two plus. Hmm. Tim Dillingham, Mike Andry, Tamara Lauder are, are friends of mine, uh, of my generation, they're old now, right? And they did some really neat studies when I think Tim and Mike uh, were in the military, um, where they did radiculopathy screens using very many muscles. Uh, and their theory was, if an EMG is going to be positive, you know, sometimes you can test a hundred muscles and it's still negative, and you still think they've got a radiculopathy. But if it will be positive, how many muscles do you have to test to be sure that you won't miss something, you know? If I just test one muscle, I'll miss a lot. If I test 10 muscles, it's gonna hurt a lot and I'm not gonna gain more, maybe. So they did go off and tested 10 or more muscles in the upper limbs of people with radicular complaints and 10 or more muscles in the lower limbs of people who had radicular complaints in the lower limbs. And they did a whole bunch of math and figured out the fewest number of muscles needed to get 95% of all positive tests. Okay, not perfect, but 95%. What they found was in the cervical region, if you want to get, find 95% of positive EMGs using 10 muscles, you only have to test seven muscles plus the paraspinals. In the lumbar region, if you want to find 95% of all radiculopathies that they found testing 10 muscles, you only really need to test six plus the paraspinals. Which seven muscles? Which six muscles? They had many different models for this, maybe six or seven different models for each. So there are many different choices that are valid. And if you wanted to follow their rules, which is, is not a bad idea, um, you, you can look up each of them. I'll show you one example for cervical that I use uh, with no further validation. But in the lumbar region, you want to abandon their work because we've gone forward from this and done something a little bit more careful. So I wanna show you a lumbar technique that I think you should use and a cervical technique that is just an opinion. Uh, uh, which paraspinal muscles? Uh, uh, Tim and, and Mike and, and Tamara didn't specify how to do the paraspinals uh, their research was done as I was evolving the techniques for paraspinal mapping, and they all knew that this would be better, but they'd already started their study. So it's probably even fewer muscles than they say, as long as you do the paraspinals using a very specific technique. Okay, remember, the old techniques were sometimes completely wrong. Ah, so this is where I live much of the year, in a, an apartment down here, and when I step out the door in the winter, I go cross-country skiing over the mountains for 15 kilometers. It's beautiful. Ah, this is why I don't live at the university anymore. Um, so this is the Michigan Spinal Stenosis Study Protocol. And what you want to understand about this is it takes the protocol 
to a scientific level, not just an opinion level. So of course it started with theory, but we had a team of doctors brainstorm and think about what would be a logical approach to doing uh, a protocol. And then we used it in a masked, double controlled trial of EMG versus MRI for the disease of, multiple, of lumbar spinal stenosis, which is complicated compared to simple disc herniation because stenosis is older people who have other diseases. They, they're, more, they're more likely to have neuropathies or other things like this. Um, we'll come back to the trial later on. Right now, I just want to teach you the protocol. So, but as a result of that trial, we have real data on how sensitive and how specific the paraspinal mapping protocol is for the clinical syndrome of neurogenic claudication and spinal stenosis. And then the other thing we did here is we put together not just a list of things to do, but the second layer of contingencies. If this is abnormal, what should you do next? Okay, so it takes you further down the road towards that wide differential diagnosis. We had to codify all of this in order to do a blinded trial. The electromyographer had no clinical information, but had to follow along if it was a polyneuropathy or some other disease, right? Um, yeah, okay, more on this. Um, come on. Hmm, oh, there we go. So this is our needle examination. If, if you're taking a few pictures, this is worth looking at. We do the paraspinals. Um, we'll come back to S1 and S2. There is no S1, S2. But the way we test the paraspinals finds radiculopathies from L5, L4, L3, and L2. It's actually good enough that if you did the paraspinals and the medial gastrocnemus, you probably have done everything you need to to find a radiculopathy. Just two muscles, the paraspinals, the medial gastroc. Don't do that because your job isn't just to find a radiculopathy, it's to rule out other diseases, okay? But it's that good. Then we'll test you know, two muscles that are S1, S2. The, the gluteus max is proximal, the, the medial gastroc is distal. The gluteus and the tensor fascia lata are wonderful for looking for myopathies. So you pay attention to your motor units there, right? Uh, vastus medialis, peroneus longus, fibular nerve or, or a peroneal nerve for us old people and the tibialis anterior. So we see we always have at least two muscles for each nerve root. The basic nerve conduction study is the H wave on the right and the left. Now, H waves pick up a few radiculopathies when the rest of the EMG is completely normal. I used to think my needle exam was perfect. There are clearly cases where an absent H wave on one side correlates with the clinical syndrome and the needle exam is perfectly normal. Okay, so the H wave is an important other test to add. F waves, by the way, have no sensitivity or specificity beyond the needle exam. So if you can do a needle exam, the F wave is pretty useless. It doesn't pick up something that the needle exam did not. The H wave does pick up things that the needle exam misses. We do the sural uh, nerve on the most symptomatic side. That's a good test for polyneuropathy, of course. And we'll do the peroneal motor, both to get a motor conduction for polyneuropathy question, and also to look for the peroneal nerve lesion at the fibular head, okay? So, now we, that's the basic protocol. But here are some of the contingencies. And I don't know if you've ever really detected this, which is diffuse paraspinal findings. Typically, what people have done is they do the limb examination and they find some abnormalities, maybe the peroneus longus and the tensor fascia lata. And they say, well, those both share the L5 nerve root. And then they go in the paraspinals and they test until they find a train of positive waves and say, ah, it's a radiculopathy, it's not the plexus. Normal people have fibrillations. The more you look, the more you'll find them. And so there is a very important observer bias that happens if you don't use a very specific protocol for the paraspinals. So for 50 years, people would find two S, maybe the medial gastroc and the gluteus maximus had positive waves and fibrillations, 
and they would test and test in the paraspinals till they found a train of positive waves and say, ah, it's a radiculopathy. I'll show you later that not only theoretically, but clinical studies, you will not find paraspinal abnormalities in an S1 radiculopathy. You will not find them. You'll find fibrillations, but within the range of normal. You will not find abnormal paraspinal muscles with a pure S1 radiculopathy. So there's an observer bias that happens when you're looking at this. I cannot, with a needle, tell whether somebody has a plexus lesion affecting S1 or a nerve root lesion affecting S1. I cannot do it. It's impossible. Um, when you do the protocol that I'll show you, you're testing in a systematic way and you find out, my goodness, L5 has fibrillations and L4 and L3 and L2. That's not an L5 radiculopathy. And then you find yourself more often than you ever did before testing the thoracic paraspinals and finding fibrillations up there. And now you're looking for myopathies, uh, statin myopathies I'll often find. Uh, other diseases, you know, we think of uh, diabetic and other neuropathies as being length dependent, but they have abnormalities in the paraspinals as well. So you find polyneuropathies, you find myopathies and other things more than you ever would have before, and then you don't misdiagnose a radiculopathy. If the person has distal predominant findings, let's say there's only distal muscle findings or the sural is abnormal, or if they have slow conduction velocities, then you're thinking of that polyneuropathy. So you do the sural on the opposite side, and you go to the upper limb and do an ulnar motor and ulnar sensory. You needle the first dorsal interosseous and the first dorsal of the hand and make a case for this is or is not a polyneuropathy. Okay? If the findings are in the high lumbar area, let's say the vastus medialis only, or focal upper paraspinal findings, then you might do the adductor longus, which is a, you know, a, a, a obturator innervated high lumbar muscle, or the iliopsoas, which is more L2-3, the, the vastus medialis is more L3-4, like that, right? Um, we'll come back to this, but studies before we put together paraspinal mapping said that EMG is very bad at detecting high lumbar radiculopathies, L2-3-4. That's a problem because MRI is also bad at detecting these, okay? Uh, one study that missed like 50% of surgically proven high lumbar radiculopathies. The pain is not radiating below the knee, right? It radiates to the front of the knee. Uh -huh. And tests like the patella reflex or reverse straight leg raise tests are negative in 50% of people that have had a surgically proven high lumbar radiculopathy. So the MRI is not so great, the clinical exam is not so great, the history is not so great, but you will learn that when you do paraspinal mapping EMG routinely, you won't miss a high lumbar radiculopathy because you're testing the L2 multifidus, the L3 multifidus. So it's kind of an additional thing you'll find. Um, and then you do other muscles to confirm. So this is a big table and, and I, I don't know how to make it smaller. Um, because this is what you need to know about this, the, the, um, uh, uh, the, the sensitivity and specificity of, of, of paraspinal mapping. So this happens to be in relationship to mechanical low back pain. Our research trial, which is in the Journal of Bone and Joint Surgery, um, tested uh, people with uh, uh, and another population of people that looked like they had mechanical back pain and a third population of people that were the same age that had no back pain at all. They were asymptomatic volunteers. Now, I don't do EMGs on asymptomatic volunteers. I do EMGs on people who have some kind of a complaint, which is why this comparison between mechanical back pain and a spinal, clinical spinal stenosis uh, is important. So we'll come back to this in some detail, but the MRI is useless, okay? And the EMG, any abnormality, um, in, in, in 73% of people's stenosis, and any abnormality includes things like motor unit changes, which, which were kind of useless, okay? Mechanical back pain had some abnormalities. Fibrillations were much more differentiating, right? The people with mechanical back pain, some of them had a few fibrillations someplace, or an absent H-wave. Um, 
when we come down to, oh, where's my paraspinal mapping? Oh my goodness, it's not on this slide. I'll show you on the next slide. So this is the, this is the, the lib, oh, here we go, paraspinals. Um, paraspinal abnormalities in one third of people with stenosis and 14% of people with mechanical back pain, okay? So you see a statistically significant change with fibrillations or the H wave or the paraspinal muscles, okay? Maybe not so much with just the H wave and certainly motor unit changes were not statistically significant. We'll come back to the sensitivity, which is not extremely high in this population. Our study wanted to follow people two years after the EMG, so we took people who were not going to have surgery. So these are people with mild, maybe moderate stenosis. Uh, my, I think I have a slide here. My friend Yaxi from Turkey looked at people who were going to have surgery, and you'll see the sensitivity is, is quite good. Um, but this is data that says, okay, the protocol itself has certain sensitivity, certain specificity. Uh, there's Bridget on the lake. Lake Champlain is maybe mm, 10 kilometers across and 200 kilometers long. It goes up to Montreal, and it's all fresh water, and we go on the lake and swim, and it's beautiful. Let's go to the neck. Um, this is our protocol. In the neck, I do not want you to think that I am more experienced than you. I do not want you to think that I have more science than you, okay? There isn't more research like the Michigan Spinal Stenosis Study for the neck. I'm gonna present a protocol that makes sense and that fits in with Lauder and Dillingham and, and that group's research, so it's consistent with what we know, but you may have a different way of doing it, and I have no problem with you doing it, doing it differently. So we'll do the median and ulnar sensory to the fourth digit, very sensitive to carpal tunnel syndrome. Uh, median motor at the wrist and the elbow, again, looking for meh, polyneuropathy a little bit, but really for carpal tunnel syndrome and the ulnar motor at the wrist below elbow and above elbow because so much upper limb radiculopathy is really ulnar neuropathy, right? Uh, do you know thoracic outlet syndrome? Thoracic outlet syndrome? Do you know the definition of thoracic outlet syndrome? It means an ulnar neuropathy that the electromyographer missed. Thoracic outlet syndrome is very, very rare, true neurogenic thoracic outlet syndrome. And usually what it is is the EMG for the ulnar neuropathy missed a case and somebody came up with a crazy idea. The needle examination that we use, we do the first dorsal interosseous, sensor indices, flexor carpi radialis. Many people will do the pronator because it's got the same root innervation, but if you test the flexor, if you test the pronator, you will never find a pronator syndrome. Right? And in the differential diagnosis, it's very uncommon to get a pronator syndrome. But if you test the flexor carpi radialis instead, you won't miss that disorder, right? Uh, the musculocutaneous biceps, the deltoid, and one more muscle that you get to choose. Uh, we'll talk about contingencies, uh, but here's where you stop and think, is this more proximal, is this more distal? What am I thinking, right? The paraspinals, I don't know what I'm doing in the paraspinals. I do not know what I'm doing, and I'm going to come back to that later, but I suppose they're helpful. Some of the muscles you can use as contingencies, you know, if you're thinking C4, the trapezius, um, uh, a really neat trick. I think most of you here use concentric needles. In the U.S., we usually use monopolar. Uh, they're cheaper, they cost less money, um, and they're just as accurate. Um, Twenty years ago, there were fights between the concentric people and the monopolar people, the findings with each are different. The concentric samples a smaller area, the monopolar samples a larger area, but clinically, uh, concentric, the motor units are slightly smaller amplitude than the monopolar, so they are different, but clinically there's no difference. So I encourage you to think about using monopolar electrodes. Not a big deal, but there's one little trick. If you want to test an anterior nerve muscle, and the an ulnar innervated muscle, a concentric needle won't work because the outside has metal all the way through. A monopolar just has metal at the tip. So I'll put the needle in here, push it pretty far in, and I get the flexor digitorum profundus median, and I'll pull the needle out a little bit, 
flexa digitorum profundus ulnar, and I'm testing two different muscles with one needle, and I'm getting the anterior interosseous nerve. So that's, especially if I think the person might have an ulnar neuropathy, I'll be testing first dorsal, um, I'll test over here, and then I'll test the flexor digitorum profundus ulnar and, and median, just with one needle poke, not so bad. Um, the abductor pollicis brevis, my old professor Jacqueline Wurst said that is a useless muscle to test. Um, it almost always is, and it's also very painful, right? If somebody has carpal tunnel syndrome, why do you need to poke a needle? The denervation of that muscle does not predict pain or disability or surgical outcome, unless the amplitude of the motor response is zero. Then, then surgery doesn't work, right? Um, if you find something there, you don't know how to tell whether it's a C8 or carpal tunnel syndrome either, right? So I'll test it occasionally. It's part of some, most people's routine, but it's not that useful of a muscle. And here's where you might get to the supraspinatus, and of course the rhomboids is important because it's the only muscle in the human body except the multifidus, which is innervated by one nerve root. So you have C5 or C6, which one is it? Well, if the rhomboids is abnormal, it's C5. So this is my cervical contingency muscles, depending on what I thought was going on clinically. Uh, let's see, there we go. Oh, wait, we're going backwards. There's Bridget again. She's having fun, but Bridget, we need to go on. There we go. All right, nerve. It just doesn't want to go. Hmm. It will go, oh, here we go. Here we go. We'll go like down here. Okay. Okay. I don't know why it's not working. Um, um, so other things that I think about, um, if the nerve conduction studies are borderline for carpal tunnel syndrome, I'll do Larry Robinson's carpal sensory index. And if people know about this, it's the most sensitive and specific test for carpal tunnel, median and ulnar to the fourth digit, plus the difference between median and radial to the thumb, plus the median and ulnar transpalmers, and you add up all the differences between those, and if it's uh, 0 0.1, uh, sorry, if it's 1.0 millisecond or greater, then it's highly sensitive and specific for carpal tunnel syndrome. It's less than 1.0 or 1.1, then it's not carpal tunnel. So if I get a, a 0 0.3 difference between median and ulnar here, and a 0.5 difference here, and a 0.2 difference here, three plus five, oh, that's border. Uh, that'd be, that would be 1.0, and that would be borderline abnormal for car radius carpal sensory index. If it's marginal for the ulnar nerve at the elbow, I'll just move an electrode, the median electrode from the thumb to the first dorsal, the surface electrode for the motor study, and I'll test the same spot here. By the way, that'll pick up a Guillain canal lesion, and here and here, and the, um, and the ulnar to the first dorsal is another good test for ulnar neuropathy. If you really think it's a plexus problem, you think about the sensory studies, and my friends here at the trauma hospital are really more expert on plexus than I am. You two know what you're doing here more than me. Um, so you might do the, the medial cutaneous nerve, uh, here, ulnar, here, median, here, radial, and lateral cutaneous. you might. The story, of course, that you know is if the person has no sensation, but an intact sensory response, then it's a preganglionic lesion and the outcome is very bad, right? If it, they have a, a, an absent sensory response, then it's probably postganglionic. The thing is that it has to be a pretty severe plexus lesion before you lose sensory fibers, okay? So there's a place, especially for you trauma folks, to be doing this down the road to understand whether somebody has a very severe plexus lesion, where it is, et cetera. Um, uh, thoracic outlet syndrome, is picked up by finding an absent medial antibrachial, maybe an absent only to the fifth digit. And, and the other part of the, the Mayo Clinic criteria for thoracic outlet is a low median motor response because the median motor is more T1 and the ulnar motor is more L, more uh, L C8, right? So thoracic outlet syndrome would be absent responses here or here sensory, low median motor, maybe a normal ulnar motor. So there's a lot to be said here. And then, of course, if, if this upper limb screen sounds like polyneuropathy, uh, something's a little bit slow, something's a little bit low amplitude, or if your story is about numbness in the feet, then you go down to the, these others. So the cervical is much more complicated and much less validated. I don't know the sensitivity and specificity of this protocol. Um, 
It's just like in the 1950s. I said so. That's not so great. Well, there's Bridget again. Hello. Um, she just keeps on wanting to paddle. Uh, let's see here. Uh, okay, come on. Come on. Um, so when you're doing an EMG for spinal disorders, in the low back, you really want to do our protocol. Okay, it's really sensitive, really specific, and validated. Um, uh, you know, when you use a protocol like that, it's kind of, uh, um, how do I say, nobody needs, uh, the, the, the referral sources for a laboratory test like a blood count or a sedimentation rate, they're not looking for creativity. They want to know what the test is. And so when you use a protocol that's known, your referral sources and other colleagues reading can understand what it is. So it adds some credibility and trust that your test is covering what needs to be covered. In the cervical, my protocol is only a suggestion. It meets Tim's uh, criteria, and it adds some thought. Uh, little break at the end of this. This is my brother Tom and a guy in Bangladesh. We do a lot of work in, in strange countries, the two of us together. Uh, my brother and I just go out and cause trouble, is all we do. Um, we'll take a short break for questions here before we go to the next set of, the next, uh, next one. Um, that's very talk, 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 but this is our protocols. Do you have questions about the protocols? <laughs> I ask about technique with monopolar electrode. Can you tell? Um, Yes, very, very simple. You know, the only difference is that with the, with the concentric, uh, um, your active and reference electrode are inside of each other, right? With the monopolar, your active is the needle, and you have to put a surface electrode someplace near the muscle, maybe within a few centimeters of the muscle on the surface. So my active is the needle, my reference is a surface electrode on the skin near the muscle. And then, same thing. It's, it's very, not, not very much different at all. Um, at, at the University of Michigan, our neurologists would use concentric needles and our rehab doctors would use monopolar needles. And if I couldn't find a monopolar needle, I'd just grab a concentric needle. It was really very trivial. The only difference is with the monopolar, I have to move this electrode. So if I'm needling here, I have a surface electrode here as my reference. If I'm up here, um, then I'd need to move my surface electrode to be a little bit closer because I might get too much background noise, right? Of course, if my needle was here and my reference was here, then I'd get an electrocardiogram, right? So they need to be close to each other. But, you know, if there's, only if there's too much noise. So I'll test the whole forearm, and then I'll move up here, and I'll test the whole upper arm, and that's, I don't need to move that electrode much. Very simple, and it's cheap, and it doesn't hurt as much. Not as much pain. Good. I like questions. It helps me because I don't know what you know, and I don't know what seems strange to you. So please keep asking questions. I like this. However, yes, please. Uh, I, I have a question about uh, the time of investigation uh, after uh, an injury. Yeah. Uh, is it uh, a month after an injury, uh, or two weeks, uh, or three days? Great question. Great question, right? So how long after the injury? Well, so first, as a clinician, the question is, what do I need to know and why? Uh -huh. So how often after a herniated disc do you really need to know within three days? Not so often. Well, not so often, but I had a, a very, very obese woman who would not fit into the CAT scanner, had severe back pain, and was a little crazy, and she had incontinence of bowel and bladder. She said she had incontinence of bowel and bladder. So we could not scan her, and she was not reliable, but she might have had an emergency, a caught equina syndrome, okay? You all know, 
at the very beginning, right after an injury, within moments after an injury, you get decreased recruitment. So in her case, with severe weakness, I could put a needle in and I could see a motor unit firing very fast without a second motor unit coming in. And in her case, you know, the same day, actually in the emergency ward, uh, we said, no, she's crazy, but she also has caught equina syndrome, okay? That's rare, that's rare. Um, the dogma, the, the religious belief is that the paraspinals are abnormal after about a week, you know, the Wallerian degeneration, and that the limb muscles are abnormal within a month. I have no data for that. I just have doctors that are smart that say this. I don't know if that's true. But I suppose it's true. I, I don't question it either. The interesting thing is um, the other part of the dogma is that as a person recovers from a radiculopathy, the paraspinals become normal, then the proximal muscles become normal, then the distal muscles become normal. This is complicated. There's no research to say this is true. There's never been a case report of someone following a radiculopathy during its recovery. So if you have a normal, a volunteer who has a herniated disc <clears throat> and you do an EMG and you do it after they feel great, then they're crazy because they came back for an EMG test. You could write a paper about it because nobody's actually gathered that data. The theory comes from um, Guillain-Barre syndrome, yeah, right? It's also probably true, but only in people who have recovered. There are two studies, one that I did, and one that my friend Tim Dillingham did, where we looked at people who come to an EMG lab, and whether or not they had one month of symptoms, or one year of symptoms, or 10 years of symptoms, if the EMG is abnormal, the paraspinals were equally likely to be abnormal, whether it's one month, or one year, or 10 years, or whatever. So in people who continue to have a complaint, the paraspinals still seem to be denervated. If, if anything's abnormal, they still seem to be denervated, okay? A complicated, great question, because it's a very complicated story. Um, just to summarize, early on, you almost never have to get an EMG, but, but if it's severe, you can get somewhere. I think it's true that at one month you'll find things, and, and probably at one week you'll find things in the paraspinals. I think that's true without data. And then the idea that the paraspinals normalize in people who still hurt, it, it's not true. Uh, they normalize in people who don't need to come to your EMG lab anymore. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. As, as I understand um, uh, this investigation, uh, we uh, may uh, do, do uh, after a month, yes? Yeah, yes, uh, but again, if, if you have to know, you do the paraspinals after a week. Just the paraspinals. 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 Just the Вообще, я думала, что вы задали вопрос по травматическому повреждению нерва. Ну, да? Радикулопатия. Ну, Радикулопатия. тут разные вещи. Вот он говорит, действительно, в среднем, если считать, то в параспинальных мышцах спонтанная активность появится там в течение месяца. Он говорит, но может быть такое, он первое, что сказал, что вы можете и через неделю что-то увидеть. Помните то, о чем он говорил? И у нормальных, у здоровых людей быть. могут быть фибрилляции. Вот. Но единственное, что если очень урген, пациент поступил позавчера, ему нельзя там сделать МРТ, КТ, непонятно что с ним, тогда будет изменен да, рекрутмент, мы будем видеть, что одна единица, две единицы, вместо того, чтобы запуститься как положено. Вот это то, о чем говорит, но все равно остается в среднем месяце. Просто вопрос, да, исследование платное. Делать его или, или сказать, придите через две недели. То есть, вот, э, то есть мы, мы должны ну, понимать, что мы ответим на вопрос перед исследованием, да? а не сделать его и сказать, ну, знаете, непонятно, придите еще раз. Ну, вот этот вопрос меня волнует. То есть как у них страховая медицина, да, в конце концов, страховые оплачивают. И э, ну, перед исследованием нужно знать, что мы вот здесь наверняка что-то вот. Хорошо, вопрос опять-таки. Ургентный у пациента это вчера случилось или что? Или он просто пришел к вам с болью, которая беспокоит сколько? Б болит, э, отдает в ногу боль, не имеет стопа, прошло... Как долго? Три дня. Четыре дня. So the question is... Yes. 
the patient has a pain, numbness, weakness, whatever, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. lumbar spine, mm -hmm. about three days. Yeah. He's coming to your office. Yeah. What you will tell, come in one month, because I will not see it no. now, or come in two weeks. Well, you're gonna, uh, you're gonna do the imaging. Um, I don't need a test. I don't need any test. He's three days. It's probably a herniated disc, and he probably will get better. So I tell him, relax, take a walk, do what you can. You'll get better no matter what. Ninety-eight percent or ninety-five percent of herniated discs get better. So at three days, I do not need to know what's wrong unless the person has a cancer history or an infection history. We don't need a diagnostic test at all. If they get, uh, I talk to patients about treatment like this. I say, I have surgery, injections, pills, therapy, or do nothing. Huh? So a person comes with herniated disc. If we do nothing, it doesn't need a test. If we have physiotherapy, it does not need a test. Pills do not need a test. Epidural injection could use a test to be sure there's not a tumor or an infection, but, but not to show that there's a radiculopathy because epidural injections are very safe. Surgery, we need to be really sure that this is not something else, okay? But now let's go backwards. So the test is to help me be sure they need surgery, okay? Nobody should get surgery in the first month after a herniated disc. So you basically wait anyhow. You give them that month, and by the time you're thinking about surgery and they failed time, therapy, pills, and epidural injection, by that time their EMG will be positive. So for a simple case of herniated disc, it doesn't matter. Okay. But there are cases where it does matter. The person who suddenly has progressive paralysis or a person where you think it's a plexus injury or something else, and then, then it's a very important question, how long after the injury? And there, the paraspinals will be abnormal in a week, the limb will be abnormal in a month, I guess. Well, but the question was another. You are a doctor, yeah. you, you, you are talking with a patient. Yeah. He's a doctor too, but the surgeon, for example, spine surgeon, yeah. He say you have to go to MAG expert. Yeah. And he has to answer to the surgeon. Yeah. You know. In the first right? in the first week. In the first week. Yeah. Maybe. The surgeon probably should answer to the patient about no, that. Ну, в общем, вы вы поняли, да, что если к вам все-таки посылают, то если настаивают, вы можете сказать так, как он отвечает. Вы знаете, возможно, я могу увидеть какие-то изменения через неделю в параспинальных. И через три-четыре недели что-то э, в, в нижней конечности, ну, например. Нужно отказываться. А? Нужно отказываться. Да. Дня, да. В общем-то, неделю однозначно, но он настаивает ну, на том... Ну, спонтанно. Это может появиться только через месяц, фактически. То есть, То есть клинически он тоже. все равно настаивает, что сначала смотрится клинически, и только через месяц вообще пациенту нужно будет что-то... А у половины что пройдет. А у половины пройдет. Ну, пять он показал, помните? Месяц. Вам нужна МГ только для инъекшн возможной, для сэрджи. We, we did, uh, the, the question has to do a lot. Um, I, I like to make fun of my surgical friends. I like to make jokes about them. But, but um, your question is about a surgeon who wants to operate on somebody in the first week after a herniated disc. And the correct answer is, go away from the surgeon. <laughs> but, but I realistically, I understand completely this is, this is what happens. And, and those are the answers. We did a study in the United States that's actually very famous in the United States. Uh, in America, we operate on the spine maybe 10 times as often as you do here. It's a, a scandal. It's bad. Too much surgery in the United States, okay? We did a study that said uh, insurance would not pay for surgery when a family doctor or primary care doctor refers to a spine surgeon. The insurance would not pay for surgery if the patient didn't have one visit with a physiatrist. And across the whole western part of my state, we cut the number of back operations by 30% by having one visit with a non-surgeon. So the surgeons are powerful and the patients trust them, but they're in, the, in the US, they're not very good at, at not operating, and they make you know five times my salary by operating. And so it's a challenge for us. This is where I get a bit militant about this. I say, Dumb surgeon, you don't need to know. <laughs> so, 
Good, good questions, and, and a contrast, because Ukrainian medicine is going to be different from ours. We've, we've got crazy medicine in the United States. Не только в спайн, я вот хочу, чтобы вы много с ним говорили. У них, конечно, интересная позиция, у них есть гайдлайнс, которыми они придерживаются, у них есть клинические протоколы. Не только спайн, все, что касается, тот же карпальный канал. Они, у них все проходит. Первая линия лечения, артез. Вторая линия лечения, инъекшн. Всем недель не помогает, ну, мы все об этом знаем. Переходим к следующему этапу. Тогда они делают МЭГ, определяют степень тяжести и переходят к операции. То же касается спайн. У меня сестра живет в Америке, дети оперировались там. И точно так же, у тебя проблема со спиной, ты проходишь физиотерапию, нестероидные противовоспалительные, инъекшн, и только после этого решается вопрос о хирургическом лечении. То есть мы спешим. Мы спешим, но они ругаются на другое, у них очень много оперируют, но это маме. Well, now this is the next part that is a little boring because I'm teaching you a specific technique. But at the, across from the University Hospital in Accra, Ghana, is this little place where you can either get circumcision or get a massage. And I worry that the, the house officers, the young doctors, get out of work at 3 o'clock in the morning, very tired, and they want to get a massage, and instead somebody does a circumcision. It's a very dangerous place, Africa. Um, there's a lot of, if you can read this, you are biking the wrong way. There, there are a lot of wrong ways to do things, and I want to come back around to the right way. Um, oh, here we are with this thing again. Hold on. Uh, there we go. So a little bit of anatomy. The green muscle is the iliocostalis. It goes from the iliac crest to the costalis, to the ribs. There's a pars lumbrorum, which goes from the iliac crest to the tips of the lumbar spinous processes. Okay, and it is innervated by, uh, we don't know. It's, I've traced this anatomically, and it's very hard to tell where it's innervated. The next muscle, which I want you to ignore, is the longissimus, and it goes from a transverse process down multiple transverse processes. And the posterior superior iliac spine is actually one big transverse process. So all of the longissimus pars lumbrorum goes from the tip of the lumbar transverse processes down to the iliac crest, okay? And I want you to ignore it because it is innervated by a plexus, like the lumbar plexus or the cervical plexus anteriorly, there's a posterior plexus that innervates this muscle. We don't know what innervates it. The multifidus is my favorite muscle because at every spinous process, the muscles that originate from that spinous process go down two, three, four levels. I have one level here. And they are all innervated by the nerve root. So this is what? This is the L4 bone. All of these pink muscles are innervated by the L4 nerve root. This is the L, this is L2, I'm sorry. This is L3. All of the blue is innervated by the L3 nerve root, L4 and L5. And so you can see that when you get over the sacrum, you have L5. L4 and L3 innervated muscles. If you don't know the anatomy... Excuse me. Yes. I will translate Please. a little bit because it's very uh, important. I'll stop for you then. Yeah. Вот то, о чём он только что показывал мышцы, да? Вот те первые к ребрам цепляются, к к поперечным отросткам. Они, как он говорит, мы не знаем точно, чем они нервируются. Может что-то идти из поясничного сплетения, где-то с корешков. Вот об этих мышцах, мультифидус, они иннервируются только сугубо корешками. Вот этот фиолетовый отходит от L2, значит, это будет корешок L2. Дальше идет голубые, зеленые, это сугубо будет каждый своим корешком. И их мэппинг, вот этот параспинальный, именно на, этот, на этом основан. Попасть игольчатым электродом в эту мышцу, тогда четко идентифицировать, какой корешок поражен. Um, so we did a study where we used a needle with a wire and tried to put a needle specifically into the multifidus. And, well, we made quite a mess. Uh-huh. So one doctor would put the needle in and put a tag on it. Another doctor would dissect and find out where the tag was. We did this with 
every muscle in the human body, in the arms and the legs, in the neck, in the low back, and we came up with a technique for the back muscles. Uh, let's see, okay. We found a technique that is 97% accurate in finding a specific segment of the multifidus, L5 or L4 or L3. It's very simple and it's very accurate. I'm going to come back to the technique, but I want to show you something else, which is early on, we did a technique that got muscles, that got into the muscles that were multifidus, there were longissimus, and there were iliocostalis. Um, we put a monopolar needle into its hub, a 50 millimeter needle, in 57 different locations. It was quite an extensive technique, and our very first papers used this rather horrible, painful, extensive technique. But then we had data on asymptomatic volunteers who do have some positive waves and fibrillations, and we had data on people who had clinical disease. And we started doing some math, and we started, oh, I'm gonna come back through this. Uh, we started, that's our original. We got rid of the iliocostalis. It did very little to the sensitivity and specificity. We got rid of the longissimus. It did very little to the sensitivity and specificity. We got to the test that I'll show you in a short time. And then we got very minimal and did less than my technique. And if you do less than my technique, you lose sensitivity and specificity. So the technique that I'm going to show you is based on us modeling from a very large number of needle insertions to what we think is the best. Not too much, not too little. Um, our early work, I'm going backwards here, one or two slides. Oh, come on now, Mike. Hello, uh, come on. It's, uh, it's frozen. Uh, come on now. I'm sorry. With that early technique, we found that people who had an abnormal EMG had an abnormal score, and the more roots abnormal, the abnormal, the, more, the worse the score was. And I'm sorry, here we go. We found that when we looked at people who had abnormal MRIs, and this early technique is not so important. This is not so important. It's just background that says we were headed in the right direction. We found that people with a normal MRI usually had a normal paraspinal EMG. People who had multi-level abnormalities were almost always abnormal. So with this very extensive early technique, we found that there's some validity in testing the paraspinal muscles. Then we went forward and did this crazy experiment. Stop, your GPS is wrong. Yulia and I ran into this in yesterday driving. Your, your GPS is wrong, yeah? Okay, so this is the technique I'd like you to pay attention to. You see your iliocostalis, your longissimus, your multifidus. There's the L3. Multi uh, sorry, that's, I've got that marked wrong. So we find the midline. We go two and a half centimeters over, and we insert a needle at 45 to a steeper 60 degrees. Not, not shallow, but steep. 45 to 60 degrees. Then you hit multifidus, okay? That's our technique, basically. But if you just do that once at each level, you will not be very sensitive or specific. So here we go. There's our L3 bone, there's our L3 multifidus, innervated by the L3 nerve root, okay? And so if I take my needle and I palpate where the bone is, and I go right in the middle of the spinous process, right in the middle, my needle can go straight in, and it's either in bone of L4, bone, or it's in the L3 multifidus. This is the secret of the technique. Now, if you just go straight in, you're not very sensitive. So we go straight in, pull the needle out, go up cranially 45 degrees, pull the needle out, go down cranially or caudally 45 degrees, and that is the paraspinal mapping technique, which I'll show you in another slide. But the other thing is that on the way down, the needle may pass through some longissimus, and it may pass through some multifidus from the level above. It's only the very last centimeter that is in L3. So a 50 millimeter needle, the last centimeter is specific to the nerve root. On the way in, 
not so sensitive, not so specific. Okay, so our scoring. There's my needle. There's all the junk on the way in, and there's that last centimeter. So we have a score. Ah, okay, and we go in, pull out, go up, pull out, go down. And so at every level, you have a score. So for this one, the needle goes in, and for all of the green here, it goes in the M, which means mixed column. And the very last one centimeter, which is the yellow, the yellow, goes in the S column, which is specific, okay? We have a scoring table, and this is for positive waves and fibrillations. If you find a train of positive waves, if it does not last one second, it's normal. If you find a train that lasts more than one second, you must reproduce it or find another one in that area. You have two chances. So you find a train of positive waves, you go, hmm, did it last one second? Yes, okay. You go back, push in, nothing. Go back, push in, nothing. That is normal, that is normal. Even if it was a train that lasted for 20 seconds, if you cannot reproduce it with only two trials, it's normal. If you break my rules, you have to come up with your own set of normal values. So it's very important when my fellows and other doctors start getting creative, the test is useless because there's no normal values they can use. Yeah, would, would you be sure? I will interrupt. Please, yeah. До этого вы поняли с колоннами, да? Он объяснял, когда вводим иголку, э, вот это было зеленое и желтое, да? Очень важно именно в желтую уже попасть, потому что там, где зеленая зона, это микс, поэтому колонна это называется, там иннервация еще может быть разная. Но дальше он будет говорить об этой технике. Что по поводу спонтанной активности? Что он считает? Он говорит, я так учу своих учеников, и это правило. Если спонтанной активности... Не... Если не продолжается она больше одной секунды, то считайте, что ее нет. Вы ввели иглу, 20 секунд подождали. Если 20 секунд что-то есть, это не считается. Дальше опять раз изменили ход иглы. То есть, ну как мы, да, раздражаем. 20 секунд мы не считаем. Это то, что мы можем попасть и в концевую пластиночку, что-то услышать там. Все, что больше одной секунды. Это спонтанная активность. Подождали для параспинальных мышц. То есть первое, надо, чтобы она была воспроизводима. Да. Есть, чтобы она... повторяющаяся, что не один раз нашли. You reproduce it. Ага, даже одна секунда. Но если вы второй раз делаете переход, и ее нет, она должна быть воспроизводима. And it will be. Well, two seconds is too much. I don't care how many seconds. Oh, even five. I don't care. One second, less less than one second is normal. More than a second, it could be. It's still normal, unless you can reproduce it. Okay. And we'll show you this afternoon. It's easier to show. I'm um, talk, 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 talk. This is like um, the rules of football. Many, many details, but then you just get out and kick a ball. Huh? It, it, when doctors do this technique, it takes five minutes. It's very, very simple. But I'm teaching you all the details because scientifically, this is how we made sure that we're doing the same thing together. So I'm sorry, it's very detailed today, but this afternoon, it's simple. You'll see, it's very simple. Um, so here's a person, and this is what I want to get to in the slides, is, is the, 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 the reproducibility. Um, so this person has a score. Now let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. This person's score is 18. I'll show you later that normal in a young person under the age of 55 is 0 to 2. In an older person over 55, it's 0 to 4. This is clearly abnormal. 
There's positive waves and fibrillations that are reproducible, more than one waveform, multiple locations, clearly an abnormal EMG. It's abnormal at L5. So this is an L5 radiculopathy. Okay. Now, a couple of subtle things to show you. You notice that this is abnormal, but remember when I'm at L5 and I'm going upwards, uh, sorry, when I'm at L4 and I'm going downwards, I might cross into the L5 territory of the muscle, right? When I'm going down from L4, I might cross into L5, which is why sometimes the bottom of L4 will be abnormal in an L5 radiculopathy, and sometimes the top of L5 will be normal because it's crossing into L4 territory. Especially with very big fat people, you get a lot of crossover of the different territories, okay? Now, this has got a train of positive waves that lasted more than a second and that was reproduced. Any of you would call that abnormal, but you don't know the range of normals. If that was all I found, if I didn't have the stuff on the bottom, that would be perfectly normal. And so it is possible that this is simply an asymptomatic finding. Asymptomatic volunteers who have no pain will have scores of 0 to 2. So you can find 2 plus positive waves reproducible in a person who has no symptoms at all. Remember I talked about S1 and people would find muscles that are abnormal in the leg and they come up and find things in the back? Well, asymptomatic volunteers will have positive waves. Okay? You need a score. You can't just test till you find what you're looking for. Um, let's see. Come back to my little thing here. Uh, wake up here. There you go. Come on. There we go. Um, this is really simple though. What you're really doing is finding four spots on the side and poking a needle up, across, down. Next spot. Up, across, down. Up, across, down. Up, across, down. You're done. It's that simple. Okay? Um, come on now. I'm sorry, this, this mouse is uh, not paying attention to me. So, here's somebody. Can somebody tell me what the diagnosis probably is in this case? What do you think? L3 radiculopathy, right? Did I have to test the leg? No. No. This is a abnormal, right? And the score is... Here we go. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20. 0 to 2 for young people, 0 to 4 for older people. That's clearly abnormal. It's an L3 radiculopathy. We did a study that said that the vast majority of lower limb EMGs with the adductor longus and stuff are normal and the paraspinals are abnormal. So. We found a range of normal. This is age at the bottom. And in young people, we found that less than two is normal. In older people, there's more denervation in asymptomatic older volunteers, zero to four. So, yes, please. Эти плюсики, это не то, что он там говорил, один плюс, два плюса, это то, где, в каких точках мы находим, да? Эти плюсики в этой табличке, это где мы нашли изменения. Вот если, если у здорового человека, может быть, там до, до 50, to 50 or to 40 years old, zero to five, 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 five. До 55 у вас эта скорость должна быть 0,2. Слушай, речь идет только о фибрилляциях, правильно? It's only about fibrillation or positive uh, waves. Either positive waves or <laughs> fibrillation. Either fasciculation. Um, we don't know what to do with fasciculation. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, 55, 